Hey, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it is a, an honor and a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Paola Caselli. Welcome, Paola, to Heidelberg virtu virtually. Um, Paola is a, a world leading expert on the early phase of star and planet formation, on astrochemistry and molecular spectroscopy. And these topics she addresses by combining observational, theoretical, numerical, and experimental laboratory work. So truly uh, a universal astrophysicist, generalist. Um, Paola started uh, her career at Bologna, where she got her PhD in 1994. And uh, that PhD actually, I, I think you probably didn't spend as much time in Bologna as, uh, as that suggests, because you spent nine months at Ohio State University and also two years as a pre-doctoral fellow at the Harvard CFA. Uh, after that, Paolo went to the uh, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory as a postdoctoral fellow. And from 1996 onwards, uh, she was a researcher at the Arcetri Astrophysical Observatory in Florence. Uh, from 2005, she was a visiting scholar at Harvard. And from 2007 onwards, uh, she became a professor at the University of Leeds, where she was also a head of astrophysics from 2009 to 2011. In 2013, she received the coveted ERC advanced grant. And as of 2014, Paula is honorary professor at LMU in Munich and the director uh, of the Center for Astrochemical Studies at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Garching. And uh, it, this year in 2020, uh, Paula is actually a Blau professor in Groningen, probably the longest running Blau professor <laughs> in history, uh, given the current Corona situation. So it's probably gonna be two years instead of one, which uh, yeah, I guess uh, is a positive uh, in, a, in a, a somewhat unfortunate context. But nonetheless, uh, I think this is a, is a, is a, a wonderful uh, uh, opportunity for us to hear from you today. Uh, you're going to be talking about our astrochemical origins. And as tradi is tradition in Heidelberg for the in-person colloquium, we would like to uh, all unmute and uh, give our speaker a warm welcome, a warm applause uh, before you actually start your talk. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> and with that, uh, the, the floor is yours, Paula. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, for this very nice introduction. Let me see if this now works. And we start. Okay. Yes. So as uh, Diedrich said, uh, today I will uh, uh, talk about my preferred subject, which is uh, our astrochemical origins. I mean, this is a, a big deal. And uh, of course, it's uh, the dream of many people to try to understand how we ended up uh, here. But uh, one thing that at least we know is that uh, more than, uh, say, probably five billion years ago, we were all in a cloud. And uh, these clouds are now uh, also visible uh, and uh, still forming new stars and new planets around uh, uh, us in our, in our galaxy. And of course, for me, the uh, uh, dream is really to try to connect these various phases from cloud scale to protostellar uh, sizes to then uh, protoplanetary disk and finally understand our solar system and then our uh, origins. As you see in this slide, there are uh, some molecules and of course we need the molecules to actually make these links because the molecules are unique dynamical tracers and uh, they can actually be very powerful because if you can choose the right molecule, you can actually study a specific part of your clouds and also a protoplanetary disk. So let me start the first with the, some slides that uh, in a sense motivate my, uh, my work. And uh, one of course is the rich chemistry that is uh, present in the interstellar uh, medium. We know that uh, there are many molecules out there in conditions that uh, nobody could even think. I mean, uh, some, somebody from Earth 
could even think that uh, such large molecules could be present in, in, in space. We now know more than 200 molecules, uh, and actually there are many more of these because there are all kinds of isotopologues with uh, uh, different, uh, uh, say, isotopes uh, like 13 carbon or deuterium, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a rich chemistry. And you can see that uh, these molecules can go up to uh, even larger than 12 atoms in, in size. And the majority of these molecules are organic in nature. And many of these are actually seeds for what we call prebiotic molecules. As an example, we just zoom in on one of these, which is the amino acetonitrile that was discovered more than 10 years ago by a Nobel Lusche from Bonn. And uh, you can see here, you have two carbon, two nitrogen, four hydrogen. And this molecule is actually just one step away from a molecule that we all know very well, which is glycine. This is the simplest amino acid. This is the one of the building blocks of our proteins. And one of the molecules that all living beings on Earth are using. So it's really, you know, the seeds, we say the seeds of life are in, uh, are in space. Then if we just jump to our solar system, what we see is that when we look at primitive material, so this is material from, for example, carbonaceous chondrites that uh, tell us about the early phases of uh, our solar system, we find mixed together with uh, chondrules and the silicate material, we see this matrix, this dark region here. And these, if you have, uh, um, say, instrumentation to look at the composition, you can find all kinds of, of uh, complex organics, prebiotic molecules. In fact, for example, in the marches on meteorites, they were found more than 200 amino acids, and not just amino acids that are the building blocks of proteins. So you can also find fatty acids that are the building blocks of cell membrane. There are nucleobases that are the building blocks of our, our genetic code. So basically, you have all you need to make uh, living beings. So for me, uh, I always like to make this comparison between, uh, say, this uh, um, carbonaceous chondrites and our other primitive material in our solar system with the, the Lego boxes that maybe, you know, you have been played with when you were a kid or something like that. So you have all the ingredients you need. And then uh, depending on which environment this material is landing, they can assemble in uh, different ways and become more complex and, you know, give origin to uh, life forms that one we know, <laughs> but uh, maybe there are also other life forms uh, uh, out there. So we have even more than we need because in life we only need the 20 amino acids, for example, to all living beings on Earth use these uh, 20 amino acids. The other thing that we know is that, um, uh, you know, in early Earth, uh, when we think about the formation of the Earth, we also know that uh, very soon after the heavy bombard bombardment period that lasted about, say, one billion years after the formation of the Earth, life started to be there. So formation of uh, life, so the creation of life, was actually done very quickly. So what's wrong with us? I mean, why we don't know yet how life originates? So there is this very nice uh, paper, actually, that I like uh, to uh, highlight here, where in fact uh, there is also Dima Semenov and Thomas Henning, uh, and in 2018 they showed in fact that theoretically, if you consider this income of uh, meteorites from space, maybe comets, that brought volatiles on Earth and uh, also organic material, and doing some interesting chemistry, for example, through dry and wet cycles, uh, through precipitation, evaporation, seepage, etc., you can actually form and polymerize these uh, structures and form, for example, RNA polymers. Uh, so already, you know, 4.17 billion years ago, they mentioned in, in their paper. So of course, this is something that we would like to uh, explore more. And in fact, this is one of the topics that experimentally, at least people in the origin uh, cluster here in, Mo in Munich, 
could like to uh, explore. I'm sure also in Heidelberg, there is a lot of uh, work going on on this. So <clears throat> the outlook of my talk will be actually touching on uh, uh, some of the topics that I am particularly interested on. And uh, we will go from clouds to basically our solar system in steps. And of course, uh, putting some more emphasis on uh, these early phases, uh, the, that is uh, the, the, the phases of star formation. So in these dark regions, dark clouds, where we think there are very important first steps that uh, are going on. So let me start then uh, with uh, the dark clouds, just uh, for definition, three stellar cores. Then I will talk about the importance of cosmic rays, the diffractionation of deuterium, which is very important to actually understand how to study these very dark regions. A little bit on complex organic molecules, and we will see that, in fact, in these very cold environments of the tristellar cores, we already have the first signatures of, say, complex organic molecule formation. Then I will talk about the uh, successive steps, so from pre-stellar core to actually protostar, disk formation, work that we have done here at MP, and then some links to our solar system that it will be done throughout the, the talk. So generally speaking, uh, this is uh, just to show why molecules are important. Uh, you see here an optical image of uh, our uh, galaxy. And uh, one thing that you immediately notice is that uh, there are lots of dark uh, filaments, uh, dark uh, clouds. And these regions, uh, as you know, are the regions where future generations of star and planets are forming. These are regions where the densities are relatively low. So we talk about 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 H2 molecules per cubic centimeter, temperatures of the order of 10, 15 Kelvin. And so it's quite, uh, say, cold and not energetic environment. So it's very hard, actually, to see anything with, uh, say, optical telescope. But as soon as you have even a small telescope, like, uh, you know, the one meter uh, radio um, uh, antenna that was used by Dame Hartman and uh, Pat Hades, uh, back in 2001, to do actually the map of the whole galaxy, you see that where it was dark, now there is a very bright signal. So molecules really are unique tracers of these uh, regions. They are easy to excite. For example, in this particular case of the CO, one to zero transition at 2.6 millimeter, this is the most abundant molecule after H2 and much more easy to detect than H2 in molecular clouds. When we, if we wanted to connect, uh, say, to regions where uh, stars are forming, we have to zoom in in this uh, um, 100,000 light years image. So we have to go down to, say, about one light year. And here, for example, it's uh, an image from Herschel uh, that uh, shows a dark cloud seen in the dust continuum emission at 500 uh, micrometer. This is actually uh, just is telling us that these regions are cold because, in fact, they emit in this uh, far infrared. And where you see this bright spot here, this is one of my preferred, uh, say, regions. It's, uh, it's kind of my laboratory in space that uh, we have been using in the past decades to actually study uh, many of this chemistry that uh, we have then applied also to other, to other regions. And here we are. So if we zoom in even more now using, for example, the dust continuum emission from the 30 meter, now is the 1.3 millimeter. Now we can see even better the bright zone. And this is the high density region inside the pristellar core where the future star and planets will form. We know that it's going to do that because it is contracting and it's quite massive system. It's, the whole cloud is about uh, eight solar masses, but you know this the central region contains just a small fraction of this mass, but of course there is still accretion going on from the whole cloud. So you see here that I divided the, this picture in various uh, parts. So there is the deuteration zone where in fact uh, we, we need to study, we need to uh, say, observe the iterated molecules to actually understand what's going on kinematically and physically within this region. And then there is a dark cloud zone where you have, you have more classical molecules like you know, HCO plus, 13CO, or things C18O, something like that, that you can actually use to study 
and also ammonia actually to, to, to study the connection with the rest of the cloud, which is very important because we still don't know well how this dense core actually merge with the cloud. And this is very important also for the continuous accretion from the mother cloud to the dense core and to the protostar when it will form. This is a fundamental question that uh, we're working on, but it's, it's not easy. You really need to uh, get the right uh, molecule. Um, yes, so one thing you want to understand are the physical conditions. So, so this is uh, the work that was done by Antonio Krapsi in 2007. Uh, this uh, is uh, a rotational temperature di uh, diagram for the ammonia that uh, we measure with the VLA. And uh, it, this is as a function of distance from the dust peak. So you can see that the rotational temperature as viewed with the interferometer, so with the VLA, goes down to about say six Kelvin, which is very low. This is the lowest temperature that uh, was seen at that time. We knew that these dense cores where stars form are about 10 Kelvin, but actually with interferometers, we can go with the higher angular resolution and see that in fact, the temperature goes down even lower. So what happened at this low temperature? Well, first of all, if you have dust grains, and you do have dust grains because they are uh, uh, everywhere, those are the ones, in fact, that cause these clouds to be so dark, absorbing the light. So we have actually that mole molecules like CO, for example, that hit a, a dust grain uh, while they're moving around. Once they hit the dust grain, they just sit on it and they will not be able to actually go back in the gas phase because there is no energy. So what's happening is that you have a picture of the dust grain surrounded by thick icy mantles. And how thick? I mean, this can be hundreds of monolayers of ice sheets, one on top of the other. Uh, because, in fact, uh, we lose uh, the majority of the CO molecules. We see it uh, observationally. More than 90% of CO is gone from the gas phase in this region. So what do we need uh, to look at in these regions uh, for actually understanding the kinematics, the physics? Well, we need the deuterated molecules. Now, there is a very strong link between uh, CO freeze out and deuteration. I will tell you in a couple of minutes, so let me move on from here. But one thing that I want to, you to notice is that the deuteration levels that we have in these central regions are really high. So we talk about larger than 20%. So this, you have to compare this with the cosmic, the over H, which is about 10 to the minus 5. So orders of magnitude higher than the cosmic, the over H. So just uh, th this is such an important point that I just want you to visualize and uh, take it home for this evening to think about. So dust grains are so important for, say, the uh, chemistry in, uh, in these clouds because, uh, well, first of all, as I said already, they are carrying these rich ices on top of them down to the protostellar uh, region and protoplanetary disk formation, so they bring already a lot of ice with them. But the important thing is that they have uh, larger surfaces for the tiny atoms and molecules that are around, and these surfaces are catalytic surfaces. So you can have, for example, light atoms like hydrogen sweeping around very fast, and if they encounter, a, for example, an oxygen, they can immediately react and form a molecule, form OH, and then H2O, and that's it, because there is no more a valence electron available. But that's the, the thing. I mean, you can actually form molecules very easily, because the formation energy of the molecule is given back to the dust grain, is absorbed by the dust grain, so the molecule stabilize there. And this is what it's a catalytic surface is. So it's, it's really there acting as catal catalysis for the chemistry. So in dense regions, as I already mentioned, we have these uh, thick uh, mantles and we have a rich chemistry. So that goes from water, I already mentioned, but also we have, for example, ammonia. Ammonia is like water, you know, you just need the nitrogen atoms uh, heating on the grains and then hydrogen is so, uh, say, 
quickly going around that you can form ammonia also very quickly on the surface and also methanol because methanol you have CO freezing out and when you have CO freezing out you can hydrogenate CO until it saturates the molecule and when it saturates it's a methanol molecule so that's the end point of the say saturation and methanol is very important because it's one of the starting point of more complex uh, organics then you have to think that even if you're in this very uh, dense and dark and cold regions, there is still something going on there. So there is still a little bit of energy. And this energy comes from cosmic rays. The cosmic rays can actually just go through the cloud. They don't care. These densities are low enough that uh, basically they just pass through uh, completely uh, freely um, or almost freely and uh, and then uh, they can impact on the grains give uh, for example just uh, inject heat uh, on the on the ice we are studying this at the moment and then also produce uv radiation because when they hit h2 molecules they excite the h2 molecules and then h2 molecules fluoresce back producing these uv photons so we have uh, a little bit uh, say of uh, it's a very tenuous uv field at least uh, say something like 10 to the minus 4, 10,000 times less uh, stronger than in uh, interstellar uh, medium. So one thing that uh, it's uh, then in fact is linked to how important these cosmic rays are is this detection that we did in 2012 to, uh, thanks to Herschel. <clears throat> this was a 13 hours integration, very painful. But at the end, it was uh, very, uh, you know, we were all very happy because we could see for the first time water in emission in this pre-stellar core. So this is, uh, uh, you have to think that the ortho water, this is the ground state line. The critical density is several times 10 to the 7 per cubic centimeter. So you really need the high density to be excited. So it must come from the center. And then you see the absorption as well. So this emission and absorption that give us uh, the uh, kinematics. This is an inverse V signi profile. So we could actually measure in fall in this the central region, uh, sub which is subsonic, despite the fact that this cloud is so massive and out of equilibrium. If you consider just, uh, you know, if you take away magnetic field and turbulence, there is very little turbulence here anyway you have a subsonic in full. And then, of course, we could measure the mass of uh, water vapor, which we found very little, 0.5 Earth masses. So just uh, to give you an idea how sensitive Herschel was. And then using our chemistry, chemical codes, uh, we did use that we needed, uh, so basically how much ice is uh, um, actually uh, present, uh, water ice is present. And you can see that uh, you have almost three Jupiter masses of uh, ice, water ice already there. And you think that some of these will actually end up in your pro pro future protoplanetary disk. The cosmic rays are important because without them, we couldn't reproduce this emission. We couldn't actually have any water in the gas phase at all because water wants to stay on the surface of dust grains. The binding energy of water is uh, three times higher than the binding energy of CO, and it really doesn't want it to go off until the temperatures of the grains are, say, 100 Kelvin. So with this cosmic ray and, uh, say, the UV produced by cosmic rays, we could make um, some of this vape water ice to stay, say, in the gas phase at the level that is uh, large enough, say, to see the emission and reproduce the observations. So in fact, uh, you know, this is such an important uh, uh, source of energy for these dark regions that, uh, in fact, that we have been studying these, uh, and thanks also to Alexei Ivlev, who is our plasma physicist at, at MPE, and who, who has been uh, studying since uh, 2015, uh, basically, uh, in detail, uh, these uh, um, these processes that go on, like when you have a heavy nuclei uh, of cosmic rays striking onto a dust grain with ice on top, and see, for example, what can happen to the chemistry of the of the ice. So we, this is still work actually in progress. Chris Schingledecker, who is now actually a professor, um, assistant professor at the Benedict, Benedictine University in the US, uh, he was actually a Humboldt fellow until a few months ago here, and we did uh, together some work. This is actually work from his PhD studies. 
and he has been studying the um, propagation of uh, uh, 100 kilo electron volt protons in O2 ice. So this is actually to reproduce an experiment that was done. And in fact, uh, testing his code with this experiment, he, he then uh, put uh, the results in his chemical code showing that the inclusion of this irradiation could actually produce uh, a much richer chemistry than previously thought. So like here, for example, you have uh, the uh, methyl formate, one of the complex organic that is ubiquitous. And uh, you can see that without the cosmic rays, you reach actually a fractional abundance with respect to H2 molecules that is actually not observable in the gas phase. But using this uh, irradiation from cosmic rays, you can enhance this by order of magnitude. And this is going in the direction actually of the observations. This is a 3D picture gave it to me by Chris Schindledecker showing a, a much better and again a, to give you you know to make you feel like you're there so this is actually the surface of the dust grain so and uh, this is the track of the proton and these are the secondary electrons that are propagates uh, once the proton goes uh, uh, down in the ice and you can see when they propagate they can do damage to the surrounding molecules they, they can break a bone water can become OH. And then if you have, I don't know, something close by, a CO molecule, so you can actually start to make some interesting chemistry in there. One thing that uh, I really liked, this was the work that uh, Chris did uh, this year before leaving. Uh, so this was a study on the sulfur. You know, sulfur is one of these big question mark in astrochemistry. We know that sulfur is in the diffuse clouds, uh, uh, in the gas phase, uh, there is very little depletion of the sulfur. But once you go from diffuse cloud to dark clouds, uh, um, something happens. I mean, uh, uh, 1,000 times, um, so basically you need that to get rid of 1,000 times you know, the cosmic abundance of uh, sulfur to be able to reproduce observations of, say, CS and other common sulfur-bearing species. Where the sulfur goes, we don't know. I mean, it probably most likely goes onto the dust grains, but in which form? Because, for example, the, the most, uh, say, um, um, obvious solution could be that it forms H2S, like water, no, again. But unfortunately, I mean, if you put all the sulfur in H2S on the ice, you should be able to see it. You should see this fissure of H2S that, in fact, has not been detected. And so we can put actually a stringent upper limit on that. So thinking about what this can uh, what, what, say, what also radiation chemistry can do to uh, H2S ice, and also inspired by recent uh, detection of uh, these allotropes uh, that uh, so of sulfur, 2S3 and 4S4, that were detected in the comet uh, 67P, the one that was visited by Rosetta. We decided to implement this radiation chemistry and in fact found that with the, the so if you take here time, uh, so from 1 million years to now is 10 million years, but you can see that very soon, the, uh, after say 1 million years or so, a lot of the sulfur ends up into this uh, uh, sink of sulfur, which is S8. This is a beautiful molecule, it's like a crown. And uh, it's actually very common on Earth. Yeah, every time you see a yellow rock, it's S8, and it's really refractory. You can try, try with your finger to scratch it. You will not be able to do it. So you know, this is such a refractory molecule that can just hide on the surface of the dust grains and basically be lost from view. So this is our uh, now uh, theory. This is what, uh, but of course, we need to test the theory. So there is uh, now some experiments going on that we are trying to understand if there are observables, because I say it cannot be detected. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's, um, uh, so we, we, we need to find a way to actually prove this uh, theory. So still work in progress. The other thing that cosmic rays do uh, just uh, briefly here. So here is the spectrum of, I, I hope you can see my cursor. Uh, this uh, is the spectrum of cosmic rays. 
And uh, uh, you can see here um, as a function of energy for electrons and protons. And here for the protons, we have two curves. One is called L and one is called I, because the thing is that we don't know very much of what's happening at these low energies. Of course, in our solar system, uh, these low energy protons are completely uh, do not propagate inside the heliosphere. But of course, we now have also some Voyager data. These are the, the dots here, the circles. But uh, still, you know, the Voyager can still not be exactly outside. So we, we think that uh, we may, uh, we, we still have this kind of uh, uncertainty. With the high curve, we can reproduce the values of cosmic ray ionization rate that we can actually measure in diffuse clouds, so we keep it. And for, with the low, we reproduce better what we think is going on in dense regions. So anyway, using these uh, cosmic ray spectra, and also here model L and model H, but it doesn't really matter the conclusion of this work, is that if we take into account these uh, uh, cosmic rays, of course, there are the suprathermal particles that can interact with the dust. But in these models led by Alexei Ivlev, what it was done was also taking into account this production of UV photons that can do this, uh, uh, say, they can act also as. Uh, um, say, produce this photoelectric effect, so extract electrons from uh, the, the dust. Taking that into account, uh, we realize that, in fact, the number, so the charges, this is the charge on the grains, in diff at different depths of dense regions from, say, the outer envelope, cloud size, uh, then a dense core, uh, volume density, and then central region of a, a pre-stellar core, you can see that uh, unlike what is typically assumed that the dust grains are have one negative charge, things are very different if we take into account this photoelectric effect due to the UV field produced by cosmic rays. So you can actually have uh, dust grains that are also positively charged or multiply negatively charged or multiply positively charged. So you have the conditions in which you can actually promote the dust coagulation because of, uh, you know, if you have, of course, if you have all your grains in a negative charge, it's very hard uh, to have, uh, say, coagulation. You can actually, especially the small grains, uh, may not be able to coagulate because of the strong repulsion forces. But in this case, you actually promote the coagulation. And this is something interesting because we know that there are big grains out there. Uh, there have been uh, uh, observations of the core shine effect also from uh, Pagani and uh, Steinacher and uh, other people. The other thing that if you do a rigorous uh, work on the propagation of cosmic rays in also in protoplanetary disk, uh, again, this is work led by Marco Padovani. Uh, it was where actually it was actually a lot of fun because uh, it was like working on particle physics. <laughs> but in fact, we were working on an astrophysical project and uh, Marco Padovani and Alexei again, uh, found that taking into account all these, uh, um, say, interaction between uh, cosmic rays that then they can uh, decay in, in uh, you know, gamma, uh, gamma rays or positrons, et cetera, et cetera, you can actually have high ionization. This is the ionization rate in the midplane of the disk for different type of disks, Titori, low mass protostar, FUORI, high mass protostar from the models of Shu that uh, he did uh, uh, years ago. And this is also the minimum mass solar nebula. So these uh, numbers are actually higher than what is typically assumed in uh, uh, protoplanetary uh, disk at the moment, because the people think that the cosmic rays are completely excluded because of the you know, stellar wind, protostellar wind. But actually, you have to take into account the whole spectrum and the high energy spectrum. And that is uh, uh, important for, uh, for these uh, uh, regions. So now, in fact, we wanted to apply these uh, conditions for understanding better also the, um, um, say, coagulation of the dust and how this could affect that. So let me now uh, step into the deuterium fractionation. And this is, uh, I put the C on the background because, in fact, I think that is what uh, I think mostly um, motivates these, uh, try to understand uh, the deuterium fractionation. In fact, 
I don't start with the free stellar core here, but I start with our oceans because, in fact, uh, if we measure the D over H in our ocean, we see that uh, the D over H is actually significantly higher than the cosmic D over H. This is uh, 10 times higher, as you can see here, compared to the protos protosolar uh, value. And you can see, interestingly, that the CI, these uh, carbon ashes, uh, chondrites, uh, meteorites, uh, have uh, a spot on HDO over H2O exactly the same as the water. So of course people say, okay, they are the ones who bring the water to, to Earth because Earth was formed in very dry conditions. Then here we see the comets. Most of the comets have actually high values of the deuteration, higher than the oceans, except for this hardly two comet that was actually measured by Herschel. So also comets, of course, could bring uh, some of this uh, uh, deuterium rich uh, uh, water. Now, the interesting thing is that from models that have been done in the past, and in particular, there was this uh, science paper by Ilsa Cleves and collaboration with Ted Birkin. So they actually tried to reproduce in our, say, in a solar nebula type of system, a, this large D over H ratio that is found in water, but they were not able to do it unless they were bringing in the ice from the mother cloud out of which the, the protoplanetary disk has, uh, has been formed. So this again is telling us that pre-stellar core chemistry is important because it really gives this kick in, this first step toward signatures of these early phases that are found even now in our uh, solar system. So uh, how does this happen? No, the picture is probably a little bit more complicated than this, but at the end of the day, this is what is, the, these are the two main things to remember for the deuterium fractionation. You need to be cold. <laughs> so the cloud has to be cold because there is this reaction that uh, goes with H3+, which is the most important uh, molecular ion in astrochemistry. It's just H2 with the proton, not very well bound, actually. In fact, it can give it to, to other species like carbon and oxygen, starting basically the chemistry in the clouds. But when in the counter HD in the molecular clouds, it forms H2D plus, plus H2, and this reaction is exothermic. So if for this reaction to go back, uh, say, fast enough, to um, say avoid to form preferentially H2D plus, you have to have a cloud with a temperature of at least say 30 Kelvin or more. Otherwise, it is not efficient. So you keep increasing the H2D plus. And uh, Dalgarno and Lepp in the 80s actually they found they had this two-page paper, but very clear saying if uh, uh, considering, uh, yes, cold regions, but for example, for some reasons, the neutrals like CO and oxygen that destroy these uh, molecular ions are gone from the gas phase, then you can have even higher H2D plus or H3 plus ratios. And this is easy to understand because if you, for example, just focus on the CO, you see here that H3 plus can uh, react with CO and form HCO plus. H2D plus can react with the CO and form, for example, the CO plus. And if CO freezes out, you lower the H2D plus and H3 plus destruction rates because you have less destruction partner. And at the same time, you have a higher H2D plus formation rate because you get a more H3 plus. The sum of, this, of the two is basically this larger H2D plus over H3 plus. How large? Well, in the model, so we can actually get a high to, you know, even one. It, it gets a really, really effective, uh, this. It's funny that in the 80s, we didn't know about this freeze out. So, you know, Dalgarno was, Dalgarno, and uh, he, he already, I think, was thinking about it, but he was actually also thinking about uh, uh, low metallicity systems so that in fact uh, could be also interesting to think about. I mean, uh, these are all, uh, say, uh, reactions that can go ahead if you don't have much uh, carbon or oxygen around. So this is in fact what allowed us to uh, find this, the brightest H2D plus line, because in fact, our the crystallar core, we found this almost one Kelvin line that was never seen before. And uh, of course, we were not able to reproduce this with our models at that time. So we had to change uh, and include the more deuterated species in our models, in particular, W and triply deuterated. In fact, uh, 
soon after there were like uh, observations of triply deuterated molecules uh, like ammonia and uh, methanol uh, as well. Uh, of course, thanks. I have to always thank the work, laboratory work that was done in Cologne, that in fact, and theoretical work that allowed us to have the collisional coefficients to then be able to reproduce these uh, lines. And so, the, just to let you understand, I mean, uh, the, this reaction from H3 plus that goes to H2 D plus continues up to D3 plus. We have not detected D3 plus yet. It's very difficult because it's in the uh, say near infrared and these regions are so opaque uh, and, uh, that it's very hard to see but we have detected d2h plus and we have detected the ortho and para forms thanks to apex and sophia sophia is very good for the high frequencies so for the para h2d plus and the ortho d2h plus so now uh, just uh, um, a little um, emphasis on the fact that, that uh, for example, if H2D plus or D2H plus encounters CO, then you can produce DCO plus in large abundance. In fact, DCO plus is very abundant in molecular cloud, but you can also produce deuterated ammonia and uh, deuterated N2H plus, which are also observed constantly, very easy to observe. The other thing that they do, these molecular ions, they dissociatively recombine with electrons and form deuterium atoms that can compete with hydrogen in the hydrogenation of species on the surface. That's how you can actually get the deuterated water, the deuterated methanol, et cetera, et cetera, on the surface. <clears throat> so this is, I think, it's explaining what we found some years ago already and still valid, and the fact that, that actually the deuteration of water is significantly less than the deuteration that we measured in organic like in methanol here is just the deuteration ratio for singly W and triply D. So you can see that the methanol can have even quite large fraction of triply deuterated uh, species, while the water is, uh, say, always a bit below that. So how can we explain that? We, we think that this is really due to the what we call the ice formation time. And uh, to explain that, I have this little sketch that shows that uh, in our dark cloud uh, with the tristellar core here, in the outer part uh, where you start to form the ice, there is still a lot of uh, you know, molecules, atoms in the gas phase. So there is not much deuteration yet. So the water that you start to form here, and you already have actually quite a lot of water ice in these regions as seen, for example, when you look at the spectral background stars in molecular clouds, you have very little deuteration. However, when you start to go deeper in, you get the thicker and thicker ices. And when you arrive to the point where you have this catastrophic CO freeze out, so you have most of your CO molecules on ice, and uh, they're gone from the gas phase. This is when the deuteration gets really, uh, gets a boost, a kick. And this is when you can actually have all this deuterated methanol that, as I said, is a precursor also of more complex organics. So really going from the, the more diffuse to the densest regions of molecular cloud, you can also uh, say, understand why we see this larger deuteration in organics than in water. And by the way, although this was not discussed at all in this beautiful review from Altweg et al. in uh, Annual Review of Astronomy Astrophysics paper, talking about the results of Rosetta and putting together also work from other, um, um, say, comets, well, we now have at least two points <laughs> in this diagram showing that the D over H in organics in comets here from methanol and HCN is larger than the D over H in water that is in these other points. This is actually sulfur and uh, nitrogen. So let's just look at yellow and blue. I found this very interesting because it actually goes in the same direction as we find in clouds. And even better or same excitement is that if you look at again at our carbon ashes chondrites, so we have and we isolate the hydrated silicates that basically show the um, hydrous carbon here, so not really the organic carbon. Uh, so here is uh, 
you find the V over H that is exactly the same as the one that we measure in our ocean. While if we look at the hotspot of organic matter within these chondrites and also interplanetary dust particles, we get the V over H much larger than that. So again, same story. So it seems that maybe, you know, I don't want to say this is a final proof, but that there is some um, retention or some uh, maintenance of this early ice in, in uh, even late, late on or very, say, uh, relatively old systems like our solar system. Right, so let's now uh, continue with the, the, car, the complex organic. I don't want to spend much time actually on here. You all know, I already show you, there are lots of molecules out there, and especially they have been found in regions where stars are forming. So you can imagine that in these regions, when you get, to say, if your dust grains are close enough to the protostar that they get warm, and then they evaporate to this ice, you have a lot of material going in the gas phase, so a very rich chemistry going on. However, if we stick to our cold uh, regions, we see that already lots of precursors of organics and also complex organics are present there. This is work actually done by Silvia Spezzano in the past years where she mapped different molecules um, in the same region. And you can see that if you just at, at the glance, you, see, you can't recognize that this is the same region. And in fact, this is very important because you see this, this shows the power of astrochemistry. So, for example, if you wanted to study the inter intersection regions here of the core, say the region between the core and the cloud, you, uh, here, there is a very sharp drop here in extinction, so it goes probably to atomic phase very soon. You see that to do that, you want to study carbon chains. So molecules that have lots of carbon. And this is because in this region, there is still not enough, so there is still enough to say UV photons probably from the interstellar radiation field that don't allow the CO to form very efficiently. So you want to use this. On the other hand, if you wanted to study, uh, say, more um, extincted material, methanol is very good because in fact is opposite to the carbon chain again remember methanol is formed on the surface of the grains via, via hydrogenation of co and then you have uh, the central region that is mainly traced by nitrogen bearing species and in particular n2h plus and also ammonia what about complex organic molecules well if you use again the 30 meter telescope and integrate long enough toward the center and toward the methanol peak, you find all kinds of complex organics. And it's interesting that the oxygen bearing molecules that in fact are daughter species from methanol are mainly found toward the methanol peak. And uh, this is actually can be understood with uh, a model that Anton Vazunin, who also spent uh, some years in Heidelberg, uh, have done when he was uh, here at MPE with us, uh, showing that uh, actually if you take into account this uh, CO freeze out, and so at some point your dust grains are completely covered with CO molecules, then the binding energies uh, of a species changes and actually allows some a fraction of the methanol that is formed on the surface to desorb. And these, of course, form also more complex organic. And you see that the peak here, this is the fractional abundance of species as a function of radius to the cloud. The peak is displaced from the center of the cloud as we found in, uh, in observations. So, as I said, nearby uh, stars, you have all kinds of molecules uh, that can go uh, off because of dust heating or sputtering or shocks, etc. But again, you have to remember that most of this ice has been formed in these early phases. So what happens if we actually compare these, uh, for example, the abundances that we find in these uh, regions uh, nearby protostars with comets? This is work actually done by Maria Drostoskaya and collaborators. And this is the work led by Jess Jorgensen, where they actually found that, uh, uh, so this is the PILS survey with ALMA. And uh, here we have uh, the um, 
molecules, same molecules that have been detected in, uh, um, in the comet 67P. And uh, here you have a very nice correlation. So I'm just citing a little text from, uh, from the people who wrote the paper. So the volatile composition of cometesimals and planetesimals is partially inherited from the pre and protostellar phases of evolution. Again, you see, you know, this um, uh, is repeating again from what we said before. This is work by Riviglia and collaborator. Here we actually detected the PO in uh, a high mass star forming regions. And uh, we did uh, this uh, comparison with uh, what found in, in the comet uh, 67P and find that also in the comet, a significant fraction of the phosphorus is actually in PO ice. So again, there is uh, some interesting correlation and PO is, is uh, more abundant at the end as also found in, in the comet. So there is another um, reason to believe that some of the ice of this icy world in our solar system are actually retaining this interstellar uh, or star formation region uh, material. So let me move uh, uh, now to uh, the work on uh, um, protoplanetary disk formation. So this is a very, uh, silly sketch that uh, we did uh, in 2012 for uh, the review that I wrote with uh, Cecilia, just to understand the importance actually of, um, you know, how to go from crystalline cores to uh, protoplanetary disk. The problem being is that if you just use ideal MHD models, it's very difficult because you have uh, magnetic fields that can squeeze in. And then once you have a lot of flux of magnetic field that tower the center, you lose angular momentum and you don't form the disk. Of course, you know, it's very interesting also to talk about the chemistry. I will not uh, be able to do that today. The thing I wanted to highlight here is that uh, the recent work, relatively recent work, actually, there are some new papers now in, uh, in the archive uh, from Bo Zhao, where we consider the importance actually of uh, the grain size distribution. So, you know, very small grains are very conductive and they are electrical, um, they carry uh, electrons. I mean, they are negatively charged and they can drag in magnetic field. What happens if these very small grains, so very small grains, I talk about 10 to the 100 angstrom in size, what happens if they actually disappear and you know, by disappearing, I mean just, for example, at, be absorbed on top of larger grains, as for example, this recent, recent paper by Kedron Silsby has shown that this is an efficient process. So you will see here that uh, I will just run uh, these two uh, small movies. So without these very small grains, we can actually form uh, disks that uh, are uh, even self, well, self-gravitating disks, but some of them can also be as this one. Uh, actually um, forming spirals and uh, become gravitationally unstable form blobs of material that then accrete. But with the very small grains, because of this effect of the drag of the magnetic field, you get uh, basically no disk. So the importance again of uh, uh, this uh, uh, microphysics uh, to understand uh, how protoplanetary disks form. And if you compare the results from both uh, models, uh, depending on the you know, cosmic rayonization rate or the uh, flux, um, mass to flux ratio, et cetera, you can form all kinds of structure that are also seen from spiral arms to multiple system and also binary systems like the ones that actually here have been shown with super high resolution by Felipe Alves, just uh, to give a little bit of publicity. This is ALMA data with the six astronomical units resolution showing this beautiful, uh, um, say, uh, tunnels here uh, uh, of material that are connecting the uh, binary with the circumbinary uh, disk. And this was okay, a little, uh, <laughs> the cosmic vets, because in fact, it was exactly one year ago uh, during the uh, October fest here, so we couldn't resist. But anyway, the other thing, and these are the last uh, things that I wanted to um, mention, and these are actually very important new messages that are coming now from our NOEMA data. Um, and this is work led by Jaime Pineda. This is a, another class zero source, a very young protostar 
Now, what we serendipitously found with the NOEMA, this is, okay, this is actually SMA data, the continuum, the outflow, etc. But we found with NOEMA a very large streamer of material that was not supposed to be there. This is HC3N. I already told you, just told you that the carbon chain molecules are outside the, the dense core. So how, what, why they're here? And in fact, I mean, this is actually a stream of material that comes from outside the cloud all the way down to the protostar. And now these things are important, not just from the camp for the chemistry point of view, but also for the dynamics, because in the center, if you get a large flux of material on top of your, for example, protoplanetary disk, Hmm, something must happen there. You cannot have these nice smooth disks anymore. Okay, so this is something, of course, there is now a lot of extra, um, um, say, measurements that are going on with NOEMA. One thing that can go on is that actually you can maybe start even forming planets very early. This is the work by Segura Cox here that in Nature actually was published because this is the youngest disk where we see these ring structures where you know it's very important uh, um, result because it tells us that you can have these dust lanes where most likely planets form because you have an enhanced amount of dust in these rings so these planets form even in the protostellar stage so this is a class one source okay so basically this is uh, my uh, the end because i'm now you know just say the next step will be to look at the protoplanetary disks but i am not working on that you know people in heidelberg actually work much more actively uh, on this and uh, but again you know the chemical processes are not going to be so different because we have again cold regions warmer regions and it's chem very active chemistry coagulation ice formation and uh, etc that uh, is going on and uh, one um, thing that it very recently came out this is from Richard Pig that was in fact a student in Heidelberg very important is that one has to now take into account the fact that once you have these rings of material you also have these flows of material that go onto the new planet so when once wanted to compare, say, the chemistry in the disk with the chemistry of the future, say, exoplanet, one need to consider also this late accretion of material from the outer part, the atmosphere of the, of the disk. So that is, in fact, the connection that we would like all to do. So go from cloud to, uh, to stars to planets. And this is uh, a example spectrum of uh, a, an exoplanet and then of course uh, you know my final words is that the future is very bright for this uh, to do this connection because also thanks to gravity and gravity plus um, in the future that will allow to study the atmosphere of uh, planet exoplanets uh, with the high uh, precision uh, and uh, also of course the elt and jwst that uh, now we are all working on uh, proposals that have to be submitted in a week time so the future is bright and we really want to um, say continue and collaborate also with our colleagues working on say exoplanets and disks to really make this link continuous and uh, understand so i am already uh, say past my time so i want to stop here and uh, i would like yeah to have some questions if there are thank you Fantastic. Thank you, Paola. That was truly fascinating and, and indeed so broad and rich that I'm sure there are questions. Uh, if people have questions, please use the uh, raise hand feature uh, in the participants list. And while people figure out where it is, I'm going to ask the first one. Okay. Uh, I, actually, I actually have two questions, but I'll, I'll start with, with uh, maybe a little bit of a technical one, which is uh, on the, the cosmic ray models. Um, yes. You discussed how... Uh, um, um, S8 is so refractory that it's actually really hard to detect hmm. and said, okay, we need to solve that. Um, do you have ideas about how to solve that? How, how could you possibly detect that? Or, or are you thinking about uh, doing follow-up laboratory experiments to try and constrain the occurrence? Yes. I mean, one, uh, um, we think that, for example, uh, with 
photons. And uh, now these are experiments that are actually going on in collaboration with some uh, colleagues in, in Madrid um, from the Center of Astrobiologia. So this is Guillermo Munoscaro, who has worked a lot on sulfur. So they see that, in fact, uh, if you start with H2S ice and uh, you have this radiation, you can form um, allotropes going all the way, say, to S8. Of course, you can see them because then you can look uh, with the microscope and see the structure of the molecule. Uh, observationally, uh, so he found, and we are following up on that, is that if you have some uh, um, irradiation, for example, I, I would say closer to the protostar, um, the hope is that uh, you have uh, fragmentation of this S8 and you can actually desorb some of these fragments like it has been seen also in the comet 67P. So the prediction is that from these experiments, uh, they, they predict, they, they measure that you have S2, in fact, and S4, not S3 yeah, so far. So we have to understand that. But, you know, if one could be able to detect, uh, say, uh, doubly, uh, say, some molecules with double sulfur, or even uh, probably longer chains, but with uh, some protons attached, because they have to have a dipole moment to be detected, then I think it could be a good proof. So we will have to target, uh, you know, these protostellar regions and look for these multi-sulfurated uh, uh, molecules in there. Other things that uh, I'm interested on, and still, we're still working on, is actually to study the chemistry on the surface of sulfurated uh, grains, you know? So how that could change, uh, for example, the production of molecules. And uh, so this is also work that we are doing. And this could be for JWST, because if we make predictions, you know, for some specific uh, chemistry going on on this type of surfaces, instead of the usual silicates or carbon ashes material, that could give some hint. Maybe this is a bit more challenging, but let's see. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, before I ask my second question, uh, let, let, let's try and uh, uh, let others. So, Thomas, you have your hand up. Yeah. Thanks, Paula, for a nice talk. And it's too bad that you're not in Heidelberg today for a nice dinner, but uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll do that another time. Uh, I actually have a question concerning your ice model. Um, you showed uh, a picture where you have thick ice on a silicate core. Uh, but as we know, uh, the cometary particles, but certainly also the molecular cloud dust and also the dust in disks, is actually very fluffy, very porous, and it will provide a lot of surface. So you may not have the thick ice layer, but you may have ice around monomers, which are then aggregated. And that would imply that you have actually also uh, chemistry going on on the surface of your particles. Uh, yes, yes. What's your take on that? Yeah, that's true. I mean, you have uh, these uh, uh, very nice papers with uh, Alexei no? Potapov that uh, they, they show uh, this um, structure of... Uh, so basically that the ice is not so thick, but uh, you have uh, an extended surface. I would say that, you know, I, I like the idea. I don't know how to... Um, um, at the moment, you know, implement in the chemical <laughs> network because, of course, this requires some, some thinking about the structure of these of these grains, and uh, there we definitely know that this uh, there must be some fluffy dust grains even in this pre-stellar course because, for example, to also reproduce this low temperature, I didn't talk about that, but we need to have uh, fluffy grains in the center to actually go down in temperature so they must be there and the fact that if you if you have an extended surface actually still i think the chemistry can be very complex as well because uh, you know molecules can move more freely on the surface actually than in the bulk so maybe you end up with even more say richer chemistry so this is something that you know i'm now just hand waving because i have not done um, myself these uh, these calculations but it will be very interesting i think to uh, have you know use the same type of chemistry we have but assume that uh, you have like uh, surfaces uh, you know, thin surfaces and see what happens. I think also the cosmic rays will again act in 
the way to provide anyway some heat and even more mobility. So maybe, you know, at the end you will have similar um, results, but uh, I, I think it could go even more complex than what we have uh, done, uh, we, we have seen so far. So it's something that somebody has to yeah, do it. <laughs> I think it's not only the surface also uh, leads to a catalytic effect of uh, the surface, which is no longer inert, but really could provide carbon atoms, for instance. Um, yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. No, thank you. This is a lot of, uh, yeah, lots of things to do still. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> so uh, Richard Tufts yeah, has, the, has the next question. Hello, thank you for a wonderful exploratory talk. Um, thank I have you. a very naive question. Uh, you showed that you could get down to temperatures as low as 6 Kelvin with, the, with uh, as far as the ammonia observation showed. Um, do you get to the situation where you where you actually have hydrogen going onto into the ice on the surface of the grain? Hmm. Yes, that's a very good question. So yes, of course, that at some point, especially at this low temperature, uh, you expect to also have hydrogen molecules to actually uh, be stuck on your on your grain. And this is actually, a, we, we are discussing this a lot because, uh, you know, the problem is that if we allow these H2 molecules to uh, cover your dust, uh, this could actually affect uh, quite a lot, uh, you know, the, both the chemistry, but also um, once you have like a dust grain hit by a heavy nuclei of the cosmic rays that actually hit the grains, it will change also quite a lot the thermal uh, structure. So we are now studying this. My feeling is, and this is, you see, I mean, when you say my feeling in science is terrible, but at the moment, I mean, we don't have a, a real experiment. We should do it, in fact. Maybe, you know, Thomas, uh, it'd be nice if you, if you can also do this at some point. And so we should, uh, my feeling is the following. So these H2 molecules uh, have a pretty low binding energy. So even if your surface is covered by H2, the, if you have a heavy element or heavy molecules, to say, uh, absorbing on the surface, it will just go through this H2. They don't care, basically. So my, 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 I think that H2, yes, we stick on it, but you know, the molecules can continue to accrete. How much H2 will be mixed to the ice? This is something that you know I I really don't uh, I cannot uh, I cannot tell. So if the ice is porous, uh, for example, I could uh, su suggest that H2 will just uh, go back to the to the gas phase as soon as you have this hit by cosmic rays, and because the binding energy is really low compared to everything else. Okay. So. I, you know, again, I don't know, but it's something that needs to be done experimentally. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I, uh, I really like the idea of, of deuterium as a sort of a, a dust chemistry chronometer. And uh, I wonder, motivated by, uh, and this is a bit of a speculative question, but I wonder, motivated by the detection of, of ubiquitous dust in the intergalactic medium, hmm. that, um, of course, you know, star forming regions go through evolutionary cycles. So to what extent is the time scale over which the deuteration traces the dust grain chemistry related to, you know, the timeline of a single star forming region or a single protostellar core? Or are there any conditions at all under which these types of molecules could actually survive beyond a single life cycle, such that as a galaxy evolves, you would at some level build up deuterated molecules somehow mm. that might survive on some dust grains? And are there types of molecules that you know, might be more likely to survive over such time scales if it is possible? Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's... Uh... 
uh, another good question <laughs> because uh, so I would say there are some molecules like um, say fragile molecules like you know N2H plus and N2D plus but also ammonia and deuterated ammonia so if left in the gas phase and if, if for some reason you know you have later on in the in the evolution of your protostar you have the ex the outflow the winds that actually expand the mo the cloud uh, th these things will not last very long. I mean, uh, these deuterated molecules will be gone uh, in a very short time. Um, I would say, you know, the, the ions, the, uh, we talk about really tens of years, <laughs> so very short, but also ammonia, if it stays in the gas phase, uh, you know, in, in a few, in, in much short in the, the lifetime of the, the cloud. However, I would say that if you can uh, form uh, grains that are, say, maybe compact enough, you know, compacted maybe out, out, uh, after this. Uh, so uh, the, the, considering this fluffy structure with the surface, as uh, Thomas was saying, that they, you know, in some, they can coagulate and uh, in the in the inner region, they can protect some of the structure. I would say, why not? I mean, you can actually bring them, you know, around because uh, uh, they, they, the central part of these larger particles will be, in a sense, protected. Another thing is the PAHs, that in fact there have been some hints of uh, PADs, you know? so some of the deuterium can actually end up in the, in, in, say, exchange with the hydrogen in the polycyclic hydro aromatic hydrocarbons and actually be um, taken there. And uh, I think, uh, so I'm not very much familiar uh, on, uh, on these uh, measurements, but there, there have been papers also by Bruce Drain uh, uh, on, uh, on these pads, they are called, uh, that uh, can, could also say uh, contribute. But you know, these larger particles that in fact, uh, there is a, a lot of, um, uh, there are several papers now coming out about, uh, uh, of uh, even Bruce Drain thinking uh, about these uh, large, uh, larger particles that are needed to reproduce the flattening of the um, extinction curve, say a, a larger uh, wavelengths. Maybe, you know, some of these may be the results of this, uh, say, coagulation and combination of, uh, of the smaller grains uh, with ice, and then they can bring with them. Which fraction is that? I, again, I cannot tell you. <laughs> okay, okay, but, but that's interesting because it means in principle you could devise an experiment on, on a future observatory that could be designed at measuring for measuring that. Yeah, yeah. So are there, I, I realize we're, we're already quite late, so I'm just checking briefly if there are further questions. Um, if not, uh, just two logistical uh, announcements. One is first that if anybody at a later point does have further questions, then please email them to me or to Paola directly. And then of course the conversation can continue. And for, normally that would happen in person, but unfortunately that's not possible now, of course. But please do uh, make use of that opportunity if you like. Um, and then the other uh, uh, logistical announcement I'd like to make uh, concerns next week's colloquium, for which I now will interrupt your screen sharing. I apologize. Oh, sorry, no, no. <laughs> no that's, that's fine. Uh, so uh, I'd like to announce next week's uh, colloquium. Uh, actually, no, it is not next week. It's in two weeks, because next week is the James Webb deadline. And for that reason, we won't have a colloquium um, on Tuesday next week. It would be very mean to the speaker. Um, so instead, in two weeks, we have a colloquium by Andrea Mignone, on, uh, who's the main developer uh, of the Pluto code, world leading numericist, who will be talking about the frontiers in, in high energy computational astrophysics. With that, uh, I would like to kindly request everybody to once more unmute and give Paola a very warm Thank applause you. for this wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.